For this next example, suppose researchers want to study the effect of air pollution on lung capacity. They gather 500 random people that live in highly polluted cities and measure their lung capacity. Then they gather 500 random people that live in low air pollution rural areas and measure their lung capacity. It is found that the people in the low pollution areas have a greater lung capacity. Lung capacity means how much air you take in. Right? So you might imagine that if you live in a low air pollution area, your lungs are not getting clogged up with so much garbage in the air, so you have greater lung capacity, greater, greater ability to breathe in deeply. All right, so let's identify the explanatory variable the treatment. Well, that would be the air pollution level where you live, right? So it's just air pollution level. And where you happen to live, that part really isn't necessary, air pollution level. All right. That's your explanatory variable, and it varies, right? Variable means it has to vary. So you have the high pollution area and the low pollution area. And the response variable is the thing you're measuring about them, which is their lung capacity, which you can see right here. You're measuring that. See, they say measure the lung capacity. See that right there? That means that that is your response variable. It's what you're measuring about these people. And then pollution, it's, it's kind of more... Um, hidden in the text, but right here it says, does air pollution affect lung capacity? So air pollution, that's your explanatory variable. Lung capacity, that's your response variable. What is the effect that it has? So that's another way to see it right there. All right, so then we want to know what's our experimental units and what's our response. Oops, sorry, experimental units and control group. All right, well, the experimental units will be all 1,000 people that you're gathering information on. So you have 500 that live in the high pollution cities and 500 that live in the low pollution rural areas. Together, that makes 1,000. As for a control group, it's a little bit of a gray area, but I would argue that there isn't one. And that's because control group implies that there is a neutral treatment. There is some, um, the standard treatment like in the case of a drug testing, like this one right here, we had the standard old drug or a placebo group. But we don't really have either one of th those things because we don't have an area that has no pollution, right? So there is no standard pollution <laughs> level, so that doesn't exist, so you can't make that argument. So I would argue that there isn't a control group in this case. All right, now a reporter sees this study and states on the news, this is what I love, um, scientists have found that pollution causes lower lung capacity causing. Ooh, that's that's dangerous. All right, now explain why this reporter is wrong. Well, you can only make cause-effect arguments if you have an experiment. If you randomly placed the people into their areas and had them live there for a while and then gave them the lung capacity measurement. But if you aren't the one that's doing that placement, if the researcher isn't the one controlling when you get to breathe in the machines and things like that, then that's no good to you. That's that's an observational study and you can't make claims about causing lung capacity. All you can say that there's a relationship. Um, there could be other things that might be affecting what's going on, such as um, genetics, cultural background, chemicals in the different zones, etc. So let me give you an example of the cultural background genetics argument. There are countries in, in this world where, for example, the people that live in the rural areas are of a different ethnic background than the people that live in the cities. Um, so for whatever reason, just culturally, they have stayed in their little enclaves, they have a different background, um, therefore they are different, period, and they will have different lung capacities. So what you're capturing is the fact that you're grabbing two different groups of people, not the fact that the pollution is causing lung capacity. Right? If you want to prove that pollution causes, you're going to have to make an experiment. You're going to have to take somebody from a high polluted city and then have them have the lung capacity test and then go move them to the rural area, have them live there for a while and then have the lung capacity test and vice versa. You're going to have to do somebody from the rural area and put them there. Of course, the easier thing to do is just to have people do breathing treatments where they basically breathe in pollution and then test their lung capacity. All right, so we're done with that. Now let's talk about a very important design to us for chapter 11, which is the matched pairs design. So this is kind of a special kind of experimental design in which the experimental units are paired up. The pairs are selected so that they are related in some way. Um, often this will be the same person, person measured twice. So they'll have you do a pre-test and a post-test, things like that. Or they'll have twins, identical twins, or, or sometimes fraternal twins, although that would be a weaker argument because they're not genetically the same. Married couples, husband and wife, sister and brother, and things like that. They're paired up, and then they'll try to measure something about those pairs and see if there's a difference. 
There are only two levels of treatment in a matched pairs design, before and after, first twin, second twin, first spouse, second spouse, etc. That's it. All right, so researchers studying this um, people's sense of smell devised a measuring, um, excuse me, devised a measure of smell ability. If you score high on the scale, you detect smells better than others. Okay, the researcher decided um, decide, the researchers decide that they want to evaluate whether there is a difference in the smelling ability for people depending on whether they are sitting up or lying down. To test this idea, they gather 100 random people and measure each person's sense of smell, sense of smell, excuse me, once while sitting and once while lying down. Okay, so this is totally an experiment, not an observational study, because now there's no really control group per se, but the researchers are manipulating the subjects. They're telling you lie down smell this, sit up, smell this, right? They are, it's not, they're not watching you on a park bench choose to lie down and sit up of your own accord. That would be an observational study, right? But they're actually giving you something to smell and manipulating you. All right. So then identify the explanatory variable. Well, that would be your position, body position, I guess you could say, body position. And how would we measure that? That would be lying down or sitting up, right? Okay. Identify the response variable. That would be your score on the, sm the smell test. Score on the smell test. Okay. All right. Identify the experimental units. That's all 100 random people. There you go, the 100 random people in the study. Now, there is no control group in this experiment because there's no neutral treatment, right? There, there's no neutral placebo treatment of doing nothing. You either sit up or you lie down. That's it. But neither one of those is a placebo, quote unquote. All right, now let's explain why blinding is not likely. <laughs> because in general, people know if they're sitting up or lying down, right? You can kind of tell. So blinding means that the person doesn't know what treatment they are receiving, but that would be impossible in this case because in general, a person knows whether they are sitting up or lying down. I mean, the only exception to that might be somebody with some kind of strange vertigo where they can't tell which direction is which. But as long as you are not in that strange case, you're going to be able to tell whether you're sitting up or lying down. That's okay though. I mean, sometimes blinding is impossible. So let me make a note of that real quick. There. So double blind studies are the ideal in theory. I mean, they're what we really want, but they're not always possible in practice. This particular study couldn't be done blindly even if you wanted to, and that does not mean that its results are invalid. They should just be looked at with caution, and people should note those facts, that, that it was done without double blinding, or without blinding in the first place, actually. This was done without even single blinding. There you go. Actually, this study was done without even single blinding, and that's okay. All right, we're all done with section one.